You see, online an author might have to compete with authors who are able to spend thousands of dollars a day on an Amazon ad. But in their local communities, they can transcend those limitations and stand out in ways they likely could never even imagine before. Indeed, as Robert J. Sawyer, the Dean of Canadian Science Fiction, told me long ago, there is power when an author defines himself as a big fish in a small pool. And I believe that authors will continue to find successes, new successes, by discovering and exploiting those small pools to a greater extent. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to a special bonus episode of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is episode 342, and I'm going to be sharing some publishing trends that I have been attending to. And that's coming up after this message about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by the awesome patrons of the Stark Reflections podcast, And a hearty welcome to Don King, the latest patron of the podcast. Welcome, Don, and thank you, Don, and everyone who supports this podcast over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. Just a reminder that patrons get access to special bonus content very similar to this episode. If you sign up, even for a single month, you'll get access to the 154 exclusive posts and we'll be joining a community that is now up to 50 members. Wow! We're, we're going to have to ask the maitre d' to slide a few more tables over to fit us all. But I, I, For the longest time, I, I called us a small but powerful group. And that small, um, the, the definition of small, of course, is growing and growing and growing. But I don't know, maybe we're going to have to book a special banquet room to host the amazing folks who support this podcast. And... Uh, Just a reminder that I will uh, be doubling down on providing additional bonus content to patrons. I want to make sure you're getting value, uh, additional value for your support, which is truly, truly appreciated. Is it so much easier than managing the the uh, various sponsors of the podcast? You guys are just uh, a a lot uh, easier, uh, a lot more fun. Uh, And and as much as I love sponsors, I, I do. Uh, appreciate that because this is a personal uh, effort that you're making and that truly touches me in 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 so many different ways so just a reminder that among the currently active special deals available for patrons there's a special coupon code to get 75 percent off wolf moons how to write a howling good story it's regularly 9.99 us that brings it down to about two dollars and fifty cents us And uh, there's another coupon code that will allow you to get any of the six books I've published in my Stark Publishing Solution series, including uh, titles like Wide for the Win, An Author's Guide to Working with Libraries and Bookstores, Accounting for Authors, co-authored with D.F. Hart, who uh, actually is an accountant, uh, and Publishing Pitfalls for Authors. You can get those titles and more for only 99 cents U.S. using a special coupon code for patrons, which you'll find at patreon.com slash darkreflections. And both of those offers are good only until the end of January 2024. So again, a huge and hearty thank you to my awesome patrons. And now let's uh, play the bumper and we'll get back to the regular part of this episode. So for the past several years, I've drafted up my thoughts and sent them over to Clayton and Grant at uh, Written Word Media. Now, Written Word Media is the company behind Bargain Booksy, Free Booksy, and so many other great uh, promotional opportunities. Now, 
What they've done is they've taken bits and pieces from that annual essay, along with thoughts and observations from several other folks from the industry, and, and then they draft up an annual publishing trends predictions. Now, I'll have links to, to this year's predictions and a few years previous links in the show notes at starkreflections.ca if you're interested in checking them out. And, and I often find it interesting to go back and look at predictions from the previous year or two just to see you know, how, uh, how accurate those things were because sometimes we, we get them and sometimes just a little bit off or it, it diverts in, in, in an interesting way. But looking at those is, is often uh, intriguing. But um, the reason I brought this up, I talk about this, is as uh, is, is further evidence uh, to the ongoing series of, of, of clues and evidence and <laughs> of, of just how scattered and unorganized I can be. I'm going to share something very uh, personal with you. <laughs> so, you know, the good folks at Written Word Media asked uh, yet again uh, for this year uh, for me to share my thoughts. And they'd sent this out sort of towards the tail end of 2023, as they as they do. I, I saw it, acknowledged, said, yeah, sounds good. And I was a little bit behind in, in getting it to them. And, and I think I said, oh, my God, uh, like I think on the day of that it was due, I said, oh, my God, can I have another day to send it? And they said, yeah, no problem. We'll be able to we'll be able to squeeze it in. So then I drafted something up for them, which was basically um, I don't like bullet point lists. I, I, I usually do. I just kind of, you know, as a ramble uh, re reflectively on this podcast, just I, I just wrote uh, an essay of my thoughts and it ran about 2000 words. So in, in early December 2023, I wrote an email uh, to, to Clayton and to Grant, and I attached it, and I sent it. Okay, insert narrator voice here. But, alas, Mark never sent that email. It floundered, unsent and unread in his inbox, only to be discovered in mid-January of 2024. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I found it. I found this email, in this attachment, in this essay that I thought I had sent uh, this morning, uh, January 16, 2024. You know, about a month after I originally drafted it up and thought I had sent it off. And so it's kind of funny when the uh, when when the when their um, when their article came out, I read it and it was good. And then I, I finished reading. And I went, oh. Um, they didn't use any of my quotes. Wow, that's... I, I, I guess I didn't have anything interesting to say. <laughs> uh, and, and and so, no, because uh, they never got it. And so I sent them an apology this morning, uh, just saying, oh my God, guys, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm so clueless. <laughs> my apologies. I, I wasn't ignoring you. I, I, I did attempt to send you something, but, you know, I got in my own way. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of scared to see how many other unsent drafts like that are in my inbox. I mean, it might explain why I've never heard back from so-and-so about such and such or, or whatever. <laughs> you know, all those, all those contacts with Hollywood, you know, the people who want to make, um, make my books into movies and TV shows. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, well, you know what? We're all human. I screwed up. It happens. Life goes on. But I thought since I had this content, I thought I'd share the content with you in this special bonus and solo episode of the Stark Reflections podcast. And that essay is coming up right after this next bumper. Top Publishing Trends for 2024 by Mark Leslie Lefebvre. One of the trends I've been attending to in the past year is that Regardless of whether or not an author is committed to the exclusivity of KDP Select or Kindle Unlimited, more authors than ever have embraced my personal perspective of truly wide, and that's wide with capital letters publishing. You see, my version of wide goes well beyond the extremely limited debate of a KU exclusivity versus the other five major retailers, and includes being open to the far further possibilities of what authors can truly do when leveraging their IP. For example, even if an author is solely tied to a single, primarily US-based retailer for their ebook income from Kindle Unlimited page reads, it does not prevent them from moving their print books and even their audiobooks into a much wider arena that includes retailers, libraries, subscription platforms, and even 
non-traditional, book-related platforms where story is a fundamental element. These trends that I've been tracking are things that I believe are going to continue to grow as we move into 2024. Ironically, digital technology, while empowering authors in new ways in the virtual spheres, including technologies that cut down some of the time spent on redundant digital tasks, is also going to enable authors to spend more time in a less scalable physical and personal world's realm, where it's a bit easier to stand out from the masses. Outside of the self-publishing realm, print books have seen unprecedented growth, particularly in the past year or so of a global rebound from COVID-based restrictions that limited in-person shopping and larger gatherings. This is a reminder of something I've been saying since that first major explosion of ebooks between 2009 and 2012, based on something digital marketing guru Mitch Joel often says. Everything is with rather than instead of. While ebooks brought an incredible new format that made books more accessible than ever in the history of publishing, it didn't mean it would completely kill the previous incarnations of books. That's simply not true. It merely allowed more venues for readers to discover and gain access to the books they wanted to read. And it helped to remove the barriers of traditional publishing. While many indie authors still believe that ebooks are the entire story when it comes to earning a respectable income as an author, and this may be a direct side effect of a Kindle Unlimited Income-focused mindset, others are discovering something significant about the dead tree versions of books. Many authors are learning the benefits of leaning into direct sales. And even if they are locked into ebook exclusivity at Amazon, they can still benefit from direct sales on their print and audiobooks thanks to support and tools from companies like BookFunnel, Shopify, BookVault, and others. While it's difficult to scale, in-person opportunities for authors to sell their books by putting them into the hands of their readers directly create something truly powerful, and which harkens back to the magic of ancient in-person storytelling. That incredible and affirming direct connection between reader and writer. In recent episodes, Todd Faunestock, for example, we talk about that a lot, and I'll probably be talking about that a lot more in future episodes. Because I believe that authors who explore the many opportunities that exist in being present at in-person book events are going to be able to forge more meaningful and long-term connections with their readers. Connections that they can sustain through tried and true methods, like a frequent, frequently engaging author email list. They'll be at local conventions, conferences, comic-cons, craft fairs, markets, and the like. But they'll also be establishing connections with local bookstores and other local book-adjacent and even non-book-related businesses to be able to get their books in front of new and appreciative audiences. Often in places where they can really and truly stand out. Now, I've personally seen success and know of other authors who have as well by selling their books via places like locally owned craft breweries. You see, online an author might have to compete with authors who are able to spend thousands of dollars a day on an Amazon ad. But in their local communities, they can transcend those limitations and stand out in ways they likely could never even imagine before. Indeed, as Robert J. Sawyer, the dean of Canadian science fiction told me long ago, there is power when an author defines himself as a big fish in a small pool. And I believe that authors will continue to find successes, new successes, by discovering and exploiting those small pools to a greater extent. Direct sales can happen in person and continue to grow in that aforementioned COVID rebound I mentioned. But they can also happen in increasingly growing ways via platforms like Kickstarter. With Kickstarter, authors can earn far more than they would ever normally earn by just self-publishing their ebooks and print books on the major retailers. Authors can not only leverage platforms like 
Kickstarter and Patreon to circumvent the exclusivity clause of Amazon's KDP Select by offering the digital slash ebook versions of their books via a pre-book launch campaign. Heck, even Smashwords has a pre-sale option where you can leverage it that way too. But authors can also use them to craft incredibly beautiful versions of their books that are far superior than the standard POD version hardcover and paperbacks that are commonly available. In the past year, I have supported a handful of Kickstarter projects where the limited edition versions of the books, which I bought for often more than double what the regular version of the same book would sell for at retail, that have special raised gold foil, beautiful edge painting, and leather or faux leather style binding. Authors are having these books produced by companies like Book Vault and local printing companies that leverage printing options that move well beyond standard print-on-demand fare. A cost-per-click marketing campaign is only effective while you are feeding that slot machine with your nickels, dimes, and quarters, or dollars, etc. Your book cover appears visible to potential readers. And if the book's purchased, it's usually only seen in ebook form by about you know, 1.2 people. <laughs> the point two comes from including those who share their digital accounts across Kindles, Kobos, Nooks, etc. But a print book is, on average, handled by seven different people. And the thing Jim Bain said all those years ago about a book cover being an advertising billboard still holds true. A print book is in itself marketing. The book is seen when the reader is enjoying it in public, but it's also seen on their shelves, on coffee tables, and in other locations. In the past year, Several of my own clients have found tremendous success in the marketing and sales of their print books. Even if most of those sales happen for them online, now I'm, I'm talking about tens of thousands of copies of books, and often with a pretty high print to ebook ratio. Even one of my own books, which has only sold a few thousand copies, has a print to ebook ratio sales of uh, 38 to 1. For the record, my normal print to ebook ration of sales is two to one. You see, I skew a bit larger in terms of print sales for three reasons. I have traditional publishing sales, I do in-person events, and the fact that I have more than a dozen non-fiction books which often sell in print at a higher ratio than they do in ebook form. As authors continue to benefit from that direct contact with their readers, more are going to benefit from the increased margin and more valuable relationship building of being able to sell their books directly. Now, whether that's through sales via their own website, via platforms like Kickstarter, Patreon, or even the popular emerging and engaging platforms like Ream, authors will continue to creatively leverage that most valuable and all important direct and intimate relationship between the reader and the writer. This does not mean that authors are going to forsake the existing tried and true retailers nor continue to experiment with newer emerging platforms. But when it comes to building a base of earnings that can't be taken away by a sudden algorithmic shift, <laughs> or some other action that accidentally attracted the wrath of a monopolistic retailer, authors can be comfortable that more of their marketing efforts and spend can be turned directly back into higher margin and quicker profit. Because remember, it's not just about earning 95% versus 70%. It's about being paid immediately or within 24 to 48 hours of a sale rather than 45 to 90 days or more later. The last thing that I think authors are going to be able to benefit from is related to a very hot topic button. No, I don't think that the divisiveness about the AI debate is going to go away soon. No more than I believe that the divide between the right and the left is going to soften. But I can see how, regardless of where an author stands when it comes to that type of emerging technology, there's going to be a major benefit for authors. Now that all the major retailers are starting to accept digitally narrated AI books, it's going to allow more people than ever before to read, to consume the works that authors create. Audiobooks have been growing exponentially for the past several years, and that's not slowing down anytime soon. And it's not just a benefit for those who like to listen to a book while multitasking, but it's filling a massive hole in the industry. 
accessibility for those whose vision impairment prevents them from reading, and also from those who can't read either because of illiteracy or perhaps cognitive issues related to visual consumption of text, such as reading dyslexia. And on the creation side of things, this allows authors without access to significant investments in the realm of thousands of dollars to be able to get their works to new readers. In the same way that ebooks did not kill the print book industry. Early studies shared by Cobo revealed that people who adopted ebook reading ended up buying twice as many print books as they did before they engaged in that new reading habit. <laughs> Digitally narrated audiobooks are going to continue to expand the overall audiobook industry. And in the same way that the wine and beer industries have room for generic low cost brands, as well as the more expensive, exclusive, and carefully crafted products, so too will the audiobook industry grow. Some consumers will be content with their Budweiser brand of digitally narrated products, while others will instead prefer uniquely presented versions of those books read by specific human narrators, multicast narrations, and other special edition style renderings of books. Audiobooks themselves are going to continue to expand to become a unique industry within an industry. And indie authors are going to be able to creatively ride those waves by embracing the technologies that help continue to offer them unique and powerful access instead of the previous roadblocks. Similarly, generative AI in search is going to revolutionize the way that the right book can get into the right reader's hands. Yes, there will be ways to enhance or manipulate the chance of being discovered in this way, but if the search is based not on the gamification of keywords in a retailer's metadata, or on who has more money to spend on an Amazon ad, but on the content of the book itself, the benefit is going to be more evenly spread across the entire publishing and author landscape. If a reader is looking for a very particular type of book, whether it's the style, the characters, the moods, the feel, the situations, or other various elements that help them feel more connected with the book, they, the consumer, will be able to find those books more easily. And not just the books from those with the most money, but the right book for that particular reader. That's an incredibly powerful win. And it's a win in the right direction. It's a win for the consumer that benefits the writer. I believe that the continuing growth of processes related to generative AI will help to further democratize the slush pile in ways that even the ebook and indie publishing revolution that began nearly 15 years ago have been unable to do. These things I've been tracking and paying attention to are elements that make me extremely hopeful and optimistic about the future that is actively unfolding before all of us writers. And all we need to do is turn with an open mind and an open heart and to face and accept those and consider the ways that we can adapt those technologies into our own personal dreams, goals, and desires for our author futures. And so, dear listener, Mark learned another valuable lesson that he wanted to pay forward and share with his podcast listeners. You can screw up, but there's always a way to learn from your mistakes. And sometimes, with a little bit of creative thinking, you can reuse or re-leverage content that you've created. You see, this episode's main content wasn't just a 2,000-word essay that Mark wrote that seemingly went nowhere. It also contains my voice, the AI voice of Bill from Eleven Labs. Mark has had a monthly subscription to that platform where he has his own synthesized voice which he uses from time to time. But Eleven Labs also has dozens of other voices that can be used for introductory bits, narratorial excerpts, and in other ways. Similarly, the mood music you heard when you first heard my voice in this episode was from an audio track that Mark paid for use from the incredibly talented musician Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com. Kevin's music is also the music used for the bumpers and intro and outro of this podcast. And you can listen to an interview with Kevin in episode 11. 
back from March 2018. Because that lesson Mark learned is to try to leverage those things you've already invested in, such as content you've written or content you've paid for. Okay, thanks, Bill. I'll take it from here. This is the Eleven Labs digitally generated voice of Mark Leslie Lefebvre, wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.